Today I put together some of the most savage bear attack stories I've covered on this channel so far. These stories include killer polar bears attacking students on a school trip, a man-eating grizzly bear on a five-day rampage, and much more. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are some of the most disturbing bear attack stories you will ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. In one of the world's most northwestern areas, in between Norway and the North Pole, you would find a cluster of small islands known as Falbard. Although conditions are very harsh and the landscape desolate, you can still find about 2,500 people living on Svalbard, fighting with the elements every day. If the freezing temperatures and frequent snowstorms were not enough to contend with, the residents are also outnumbered by one of the deadliest predators in the world, the polar bear. There are frequent bear attacks as the animals search for food, and frequent deaths as a result for both people and the polar bears. Despite these risks, Svalbard is known for having a beautiful variety of arctic wildlife, some that can only be seen on Svalbard itself. Tourists come to the area to see Svalbard reindeers, arctic foxes, walruses, and a number of seal and whale species. Many also come to specifically see the polar bears as their numbers are still decreasing, so many believe it may be their last chance to see this amazing animal in the wild. However, extra care must be taken around these animals, or the worst might happen. Horatio Chappelle was just 17 years old in 2011 when he visited Svalbard with the British School's Exploring Society for an adventure holiday. His parents were concerned about the possibility of bear attacks, but were told that many safety precautions were in place and so they relented and allowed him to go. He was described as inquisitive, hardworking, and determined, and was well liked by his peers. He had a passion for medicine and was expected to become a brilliant doctor. However, this trip would change everything and unfortunately, Horatio would not be able to fulfill his dreams. The group arrived in Svalbard on July 23, 2011, which consisted of 80 people in total, including adults and teenagers. The trip was supposed to be over a month long, with long hikes and cramped tents, but memories for a lifetime. The group was very excited for the expedition and to begin exploring. Two weeks had passed and they were halfway through their trip. Everyone was now firm friends and they bonded over the hardships of their experiences. Horatio was having an amazing trip and on August 5th, he went to sleep in his tent, feeling excited about what the next day would hold. Earlier that day, the group had seen some polar bear footprints, but as the animal was common in this area, there was no immediate concern and they were simply amazed to see any sign of the bears. Unfortunately, that night, the camp would be attacked by a starving male bear and Horatio would be killed. That night, Horatio was sharing his tent with two other friends, Scott Bennell Smith, 16, and Patrick Flinders, 17. At around 7.30 a.m., Scott was suddenly awoken by the tent shaking. He thought he was being shaken awake by someone when suddenly, the tent was ripped apart by a skinny male polar bear. It was clear that he hadn't eaten for some time, which many believe fueled the bear's aggression toward the group. As the bear struck out, he hit both Scott and Patrick, who sustained head and back injuries. Patrick, who had survived the terrifying attack but was left with horrifying facial scars, later recalled what happened that night. While sleeping in his tent, he was woke up from the tent being shaken violently. Within seconds, the tent collapsed down on him and his friends with great force. By the time he lifted the collapsed tent's fabric away from his face, an aggressive polar bear began swiping and snapping at his face. Its claws were huge and sliced through his skin effortlessly. The blood around its mouth and nose were easy to see because of its white fur, and at this moment, Patrick thought he was going to die. Patrick threw his arms in front of his face to protect himself from the attack when suddenly, he felt the bear's teeth clamp down around his elbow and the bear forcing his arm away from his face before biting down on his skull. 
I could hear it crack, he said, and then I heard a growl which was deafening because I was so up close. In a last ditch effort to save himself from being devoured by the bear, he punched the bear repeatedly in the face until it miraculously let him go and set its sights on Horatio. Matthew Burke was in another tent, but he awoke by the screams of his friends as they shouted to alert the camp of the bear. He saw Horatio being dragged along the snow. The bear had a firm grip upon his head, and when it let go, it reared up and slammed itself down onto Horatio's body. It's thought that if he hadn't been killed by the severe head injury that had already occurred, this was the moment Horatio sadly passed away. The group panicked and the noise woke one of the adults, Michael Reed, 29. He grabbed a rifle and left the tent, aimed to save the young man. He lined up the shot, cocked the rifle, and fired, but the bullets fell to the ground. He tried to fire more rounds, but the rifle was not working. Now, the bear had his sights on Michael. Fear filled his body as he realized that this bear would try to eat him, while he had nothing to defend himself with. The bear was quickly upon him and he felt the animal's teeth sink into his head. The pain was indescribable, but he had to focus if he was going to survive. From his training, he knew that the weakest part of the polar bear would be its eyes, and so attempted to gouge them in an attempt to escape. But the bear was unfazed and continued to maul him. The mountain leader, Andrew Ruck, 27, then charged at the bear. He shouted and threw rocks, but then the bear turned on him too. He was knocked to the ground and the bear was on top of him, swiping at his head. He stared at the bear, thinking that this would be his last moment on earth and just praying that he would be able to escape. Fortunately, his prayers were answered. Once Michael had escaped, he was able to grab the rifle, reload it, and with a massive bang, he shot the bear dead. They were safe, and he had survived an attack from one of the deadliest animals in the world. How did this incident even happen? Why was a young man killed when his parents were assured that there was no danger to their son? All of the group were supposed to be given pen flares, as well as trip wires around the camp to alert them of nearby bears. After an inquest, it came to light that this was not actually the case. It was revealed that only the team leaders have these devices, not all members of the group. This was a critical issue, as if Horatio or any other member of this group had these devices, they would have been able to fire them at the bear and would potentially have avoided death. The team leader explained that while it was their plan to give everyone a pen flare, they realized that once they got to the base camp, they had not packed enough. A fatal mistake. But how did the bear get this close in the first place? The tripwire surrounded the camp was meant to alert the group of approaching animals with a large bang from the firing of the device. There are usually four devices set up around a camp. Using corner pass attached to fine fishing line which would act as a tripwire. The first issue arose when the group had to use three devices instead and made a triangular campsite. The fishing line had been exchanged for fluorescent cord to avoid false firing, and the devices themselves were not complete, as there was a shortage of triggers. Ultimately, the protections set up around the camp were not enough, and the devices did not fire when they were most needed. In addition, due to the presence of the tripwires, leaders believed it was safe enough to not organize a bear watch, meaning everyone simply went to bed rather than to watch out for bears. The last issue is the rifle that was used. There was only one rifle taken on this trip, and it misfired several times, which caused two more members of the group to be attacked by the bear. The rifle in question was a Moser 98K rifle, which dated back to the Second World War. It was improperly stored and handled, and the training of the team was extremely limited, which was the final fatal mistake. After the team returned home and Horatio's body was returned to his family, the inquest found that BSES did not act criminally negligible under criminal law, but admitted that this death was caused by a number of unfortunate circumstances. His parents tried to appeal this decision, but Norwegian prosecutors also agreed that no criminal charges could be brought. Instead, to help the family grieve, they set up a charity in Horatio's name called Horatio's Garden. 
When he was alive, he would volunteer at Salisbury's final center and suggested that a garden should be created away from the wards, giving the patients and their families somewhere beautiful to visit. There are currently eight of these gardens across the UK, and in 2019, HRH Princess Eugene became a royal patron of the charity. Even in death, Horatio has been able to change the lives of countless patients and their families. The grizzly bear is a fierce predator and should be avoided at all costs. They have been responsible for over 180 deaths, although the majority of the time, bear attacks are very rare. They will usually only attack when they are protecting food, cubs, or territory, and would rather avoid humans altogether. However, there are some people who intentionally seek them out and enter their territory, like Timothy Treadwell, aka the Grizzly Man. Even from a young age, Timothy had always been particularly fond of animals and even had a pet squirrel when he was a child. In his adolescence, he had his first encounter with a wild bear while studying them in Alaska, and that's when he realized his true life calling. He stated that he had lost his way at college and he had fallen into alcoholism and drug use, nearly overdosing on heroin in the late 80s. This close call with death is what motivated him to initially search out bears and make them his lifelong passion. He studied the bears for 13 years and wrote a book from his findings called Among Grizzlies Living with Wild Bears in Alaska. During this time, the bears became used to his presence and he was able to touch them and play with their cubs. In his own words, he stated that he had a good relationship with bears based on mutual trust and respect. Following this, Timothy began to gain some recognition for his work in television and environmental circles. He traveled around the U.S. to educate local schools and appeared on many TV shows to explain his unique experiences with the animals. He even created his own charity with co-worker Jewel Palovac called Grizzly People, with the plan to continue protecting the grizzly bears and their habitat. Timothy was met with controversy throughout his life, mainly due to his interference with the animals. The National Park Service, in particular, were very unhappy and worried with his actions as they believed that he was disrupting the animal's natural behavior, as well as putting himself at enormous risk. Timothy was also leading unauthorized tours with visitors to take them closer to the animals, something that was never allowed by the parks. He was thought to be reckless as he refused to install any electric fences around the camps and carrying bear spray, stating that bears would never hurt him due to their relationship. Despite their fears, Timothy did not bring any further protection from the bears, and he would soon find out that his relationship with these bears could easily be broken. Never forget how wild a wild animal can truly be and never underestimate them. In October 2003, Timothy and his girlfriend, Amy Huguenard, visited Katmai National Park in Alaska. They were warned of the dangers of camping in the area at this time of year as food was scarce and the bears were preparing for winter, eating anything they could to store for hibernation in the coming months. The aim of the trip was to see one of Timothy's favorite female brown bears and wanted to check that she was okay and ready for the winter. Amy was very reluctant to do this as she was particularly scared of bears and just wanted to go home, but she stayed as she knew how important the bears were to her boyfriend. Throughout the trip, the pair tracked a few of the bears, but Timothy quickly realized that the majority of the bears that were familiar with him had gone into hibernation already and there were a number of unfamiliar bears. Although he was slightly uncomfortable with the thought of being surrounded by bears that did not know him, he still decided to stay and set up camp with Amy. On October 5th, the pair were setting up their video camera to get some more footage of the bears. The setup was nearly complete. The camera was on and recording audio, but the lens cap was still in place, providing no visuals as of yet. Soft rain sounds can be heard as Amy prepares the equipment from inside the tent. Suddenly, Amy calls out to Timothy, asking him if he's still out there as she can't hear him. Then the screaming begins. 
Timothy was screaming to Amy to get out of the tent and to escape as he is torn apart by the large, 28-year-old male bear. Amy opens the tent and then also begins screaming and tells Timothy to play dead to get the bear to leave him alone, which seemed to have worked for a time as the pair can be heard discussing whether the bear was truly gone yet. In this time, Amy is thought to have approached Timothy to tend to his wounds which were unknown at this point. She was being trained as a physician's assistant at the time, but she had to retreat as the bear returned to attack Timothy once again. This is when Timothy begins to panic as he realizes playing dead is no longer going to work. He begs Amy to hit the bear with something, and she grabs a frying pan to smack the bear in the head. The bear lets go of Timothy's head, and instead, bites into his thigh to drag him away from Amy. Covered in blood and knowing he has no chance of survival past this point, Timothy begins shouting to Amy, telling her to get away and save herself. Although he struggled, he knew enough about bears to know he was done for. Unlike other victims of bear attacks, he did not go into shock, and so was fully aware the entire time he was eaten alive by the animals that he so adored. The bear was silent, aside from sporadic growls and grunts. The only real sound that could be heard during this ordeal is the sound of Timothy desperately trying to escape. His screams of agony and the dull sound of his body being dragged across the dirt away from his camp. Unfortunately, Amy still did not leave. She was frozen with fear and very much in shock. She was already terrified of bears and had just witnessed her worst nightmare. She was not familiar with the area, being brought to the park by Timothy, and so had no idea how to get back to civilization. On the tape, you can hear that she just begins to scream. It was a scream similar to that of a wounded animal as she realized what she had just witnessed as well as her situation. Unfortunately, this simply brought the bear right back to her to finish the job and so Amy was also killed, mauled to death by the same bear. The next morning, air taxi pilot Willie Fulton arrived at Kathlia Lake to transport the pair out of the area. He looked around and thought he could see Timothy shaking a tarp to get his attention, but when Willie called out, there was no response. He decided to hike up the path but quickly turned around as he felt like something wasn't right. Once he reached his plane, he turned around and saw something that made his blood turn cold. Through the fog, a large, nasty-looking brown bear was staring at him, just aside from the path that he had just walked up. He quickly climbed back into his plane and set off, hoping to steer the bear off so that Timothy and Amy would be able to pass through without meeting the bear. He kept his eyes on the bear and could see him slowly eating something. Willie circled the campsite 15 to 20 times, each time trying to get a better look at the bear. That's when he realized what the bear was eating. It was a human ribcage. Horrified, he called the park ranger and asked them to come and survey the area as he believed something had happened to the pair. A group of rangers arrived and began to trek up to the campsite with Willie. They spotted a couple of bears on their way up, but as they were ignored by the bears, they continued without an issue. Suddenly, one of the rangers shouted, Bear! Alerting the others to the animal about 20 feet away. They began shouting at the bear in an attempt to scare it off, but it soon became clear that it knew they were there, was not threatened, and was in fact actively stalking them. They all began to shoot the bear, firing a total of 21 shots between the three rangers. The bear was shot dead. They continued to the campsite. There they found the two tents, collapsed and torn with a large mud pile in the front of the entrance. The rangers moved some of the mud aside and found Amy's body, her fingers pushing through the dirt. She had been buried by the bear, ready for winter. When they moved the rest of the mud aside, she looked as though she was peacefully sleeping, except for the clear fact that she had been mostly eaten by the bear. They were horrified, but determined to find Timothy, although the hopes of him being alive were fading fast. They combed the nearby area and found bits of him all around. His head was found, attached to a piece of the spine and a horrific grimace on his face, capturing the pain in which he died. His right arm and hand were found laying nearby, his watch still attached. It was truly a gruesome scene to find. 
As the rangers were discovering the bodies, another smaller bear attempted to approach them. He was approximately three years old and was stalking the team from 30 feet away, making it clear that he would continue to approach and attempt to attack them also. He was swiftly shot by the rangers. Once Timothy and Amy's bodies had been extracted from the park, the rangers sent the corpse of the larger bear to be investigated. A necropsy was conducted and it was found that the bear had human remains and clothing within its stomach, concluding that this was the bear that had killed and eaten the couple. The younger bear had already been cannibalized by other bears, so we will never know if it had anything to do with their deaths. Ultimately, it's important to remember to respect wild animals and give them the space that they deserve. Even if bonds are formed with the animals, you never know what might happen or what else might be lingering in the forest. Usually, bears will only attack humans if they are scared or threatened. This alone should encourage people to leave the animal alone. However, if they choose not to, they are unlikely to survive the tale, as brown bears are 20 more times dangerous than their black subspecies, and 4 times more than the polar bear. Knowing this, it makes our topic for today even scarier. We'll be looking at one of the worst bear attacks ever recorded, which left 7 people dead and 3 more injured in a terrifying rampage that lasted 5 days. The Usuri subspecies of brown bear is found on the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido. These bears are particularly feared in Japan as they are very large and well known to attack humans, having killed over 200 people in the last century alone. All of these attacks were usually isolated and only one or two people would die. However, one bear named Kasagake, meaning wind shadow, would change this forever. In the winter of 1915 in Sankabetsu, the animal was first spotted. Measuring at nearly 9 meters tall and 340 kilograms or over 700 pounds, this bear was a truly terrifying size. He had woken up early from hibernation and was now starving so approached a family farm. Although he scared the Akita family that lived there, he was only interested in their corn that they were growing in the field. And when their horse started making noise due to its panic, the bear was scared off. A few days later, the bear came back. This time, the family wanted to make sure that it didn't return, and so the head of the family arranged for his second son, Kametaro, and two local hunters to be ready for when the bear came back. When he then reappeared for the third time, ten days later, they shot at him several times but Kasegake was only injured and retreated into the forest. The men tracked him into the forest, following the bloodstains that he had left behind in the snow, but soon conditions became too treacherous and they had to give up their search. They came to the conclusion that he would not return as he had been taught to associate humans with pain, and so he would be too scared to return. Unfortunately, they were wrong. On December 9th, 1915, Kasegake completed his first kill, the Oda family. That morning, the wife of the house, Abe Mayu, was inside babysitting her friend's young baby, Hasumi Mikio, while her husband tended to the farm nearby. The pair were inside the house, unaware of the danger and simply going about the morning routine of caring for a small child. At 10.30 am, the bear arrived at the home of the Ota family. He suddenly attacked the baby, killing him instantly with a savage bite to the head. Mayu was screaming. She hoped that her husband would hear her and save her from this massive animal and do something to scare it away. She ran for the door but Kasegake was blocking it and knocked her to the ground, dragging her out of the house and into the forest to finish her off. Unfortunately, no one came to save her and she was killed by the bear. When her husband returned from the farm, he collapsed. The farmhouse was covered in pools of blood and the body of Mikio was still in the middle of the room. He was devastated that his wife was gone. He had no hope of her survival against the bear. No one had any hope against such an animal. The next day, 30 men entered the forest to hunt down the bear and recover what was left of Mayu's body. 
they didn't have to search for long. 150 meters into the forest, they saw a large shadowy figure in front of them and knew it was the culprit. Five of the 30 men began shooting at the bear, but only one was able to hit him. Although this enraged the bear, it retreated into the forest and didn't attack the men. Feeling accomplished, they continued with their journey into the forest and began following bloodstains that they found in the snow. This led them to the dismembered body of Abe Mayu. She had been mostly devoured by the animal and so only her head and legs remained. Her body had been partially buried in the snow so that it could be preserved for the bear to return to later on. It was truly a horrific sight to see. That evening, the bear returned to the Oda family home once again. But although the villagers shot at him once again, he escaped unhurt. After hearing about the attacks and hearing the shots within the forest, the women and the children of the village had begun to panic. They all sought refuge at the house of Miyuki Yazutaro and gathered together while only one guardsman was stationed outside to protect them. That night, Miyuki Yazutaro's wife, Yeo, was preparing a meal with some of the other women while carrying her son, Yumikichi, on her back. She heard rustling behind her, and before she even had time to turn, Kasengake smashed through the window, sending glass flying everywhere. As the cooking pot was pushed over, the fire was quenched and the oil lamps went off, plunging the house into darkness. All that could be heard was the screams of the women and children as they panicked, running to try to find an exit in the dark. Yeyo tried to escape but was tripped by one of the younger sons who was clinging to her legs in fear, begging her to save him. The bear proceeded to attack them both, clawing at them with his enormous paws. The house guard, Oda, was hidden behind some furniture, but while the bear attacked Yeyo and her children, he was spotted. Kasegake quickly turned his attention to the man, and as he tried to flee through the front door, the bear quickly swiped him and scratched deep marks into his back as he fled. This interaction gave Yeyo and her children enough time to escape, and they ran from the house, screaming for the other guardsmen to help them. Blood was now covering every corner of the house as the screams of the injured and dying filled the air. Kazegake then attacked and killed two more young boys before turning his attention to Take Ishiguro, who was heavily pregnant at the time. She was cornered by the huge animal and knew she had no chance of escape. She pleaded with the animal to not hurt her unborn child or touch her belly, and to only eat her head. She was quickly attacked, killed and eaten by the bear, and although the fetus was found alive in her body, it soon died also. In two days, six people had now died at the hands or paws of Kasegake. The guards had now returned to the cottage, led by a very badly injured Yeo. Although it was dark, they could hear sounds of the attack from within the house, so it was proposed that they would simply burn the house down as they would surely kill the man-eater. Yeo was convinced that the children inside were still alive and fought against the guards, forbidding them from burning it down. The guards split into two groups and surrounded the hut, but the bear had already left the scene, leaving a path of death and destruction behind him. As the injured were taken to a safe house, Miyuki Yazutaro sought for a solution. He had lost two children and his wife, and was gravely hurt as well, so he was desperate to rid the bear that was terrorizing the town. He had heard of an expert bear hunter who was close by and went to find him. Yamimoto Haikichi is thought to have killed over 300 bears in his lifetime and was somewhat of a local legend. Surprisingly, he already knew of the bear Kasegake. Many years ago, there had been a similar attack which had killed three women in the past, and this bear was also thought to be Kasegake. After hearing the full extent of the most recent attack and how helpless the villagers were, he finally agreed to join them and kill the bear once and for all. The next few days were spent with several different teams trying to find and kill the bear. He had ransacked the locals' food and damaged eight houses by now and the situation was becoming desperate. 
the men even used the corpse of Mayu to attract the bear, which angered many members of the village as they believed the plan was disrespectful to the dead. Regional police had now heard about the attack and sent a sniper team to kill Kasegake, but they couldn't find him either. Finally, five days after the first sighting of the bear, he was finally shot and killed by Yamamoto Haikichi, with one shot to the heart and another to the head. The rampage was finally over. Sadly, this event caused the destruction of the village. Although Yeo survived, her young son died years later of his injuries, and due to the horrific events that unfolded, people began to leave to find somewhere else to settle instead. Eventually, they all abandoned the area, leaving it to the bears and the ghosts of the past. There is now a shrine to pray for the dead villagers called the Bear Harm Cenotaph, and the story of Kasegake has passed into legend. Torngat Mountains National Park lies on the Labrador Peninsula in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Covering 9,700 square kilometers, the park is famous for its gorgeous snow-covered mountaintops and breathtaking wilderness. The park is home to many wild creatures, including wolves, golden eagles, reindeer, and of course, polar bears. The polar bear is undoubtedly one of nature's most refined killing machines, weighing over 750 kilograms of pure muscle and growing as far as 10 feet tall. An adult male can bite with a force that is equal to 1200 psi, more than enough to crack a full-grown human skull as if it were an egg. Unlike his brown cousin, the grizzly bear, who will shy away from humans and only attack if disturbed or otherwise threatened, the polar bear is hyper-aggressive towards humans and is mainly a carnivorous animal. Most, if not all of his diet consists of meat that he usually hunts on his own. This basically means that the polar bear is a much more experienced hunter than his relative, so it's no wonder that the polar bears are among the select few of apex predators on planet Earth that have developed a taste for human flesh, and will go out of their way to actively hunt and eat humans if given the chance. Within the Arctic Circle lies the polar bear's need of range, where it primarily hunts seals. But when seals are difficult to come by, these bears can survive off of eating just about anything, including fish, birds, rodents, and even human garbage. Additionally, polar bears have an acute sense of smell, which allows them to accurately trap prey up to 1.6 kilometers away. This is the disturbing story of a nature-loving man who was unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of one of these beasts' powerful jaws, helplessly getting mauled as his ligaments tore and bones shattered while his friends could only watch in horror. Matthew Dyer was a 48-year-old lawyer living in Easton, Maine who was obsessed with all things nature. He'd frequently spend his vacations going on hiking trips, his obsession with nature reaching a point where tattoos of various wildlife creatures were riddled across his body. This story began in the winter of 2012, when Dyer felt the urge to go on yet another grand adventure. As he was browsing through a magazine, he saw an ad for an outing to the Torngat National Park in Labrador, Canada. Matthew Dyer had never heard of it before, nor had he ever seen a real-life polar bear, but felt reasonably intrigued by what he read and decided to sign up for the trip after doing a bit of research. Before leaving on the trip, Dyer's main concern was that he wouldn't be in good enough physical condition. To make sure he could traverse the terrain, he trained all winter, carrying around a heavy backpack while exercising regularly. The journey to Torngat necessitates careful planning, registration with the park's officials, a lengthy approval process, and the carrying of appropriate equipment to ensure things go smoothly for all participants. Additionally, anyone visiting the park is obliged to view a DVD on polar bear safety. It's extremely easy to get lost in Torngat Park, as there are no roads, no campgrounds, and no directional signs indicating what to visit or where to go. Visitors are instead strongly advised to hire a certified polar bear guard not only for protection, but for guidance should they find themselves lost. Excited, 
dire leader flew with a group of like-minded explorers from Montreal to a town called Kujak, which lies in northern Quebec. From there, the group made their way to a base camp, where a plane would arrive to hoist them over to the Torangant Mountains and eventually onto the coast of Labrador. The trip was led by two of the senior Sierra Club hikers, Sierra Club being a non-profit organization dedicated to conservation and education regarding nature and the wildlife that inhabits it. The first guide was 60-year-old Rich Gross, who originally worked for a low-income housing non-profit in San Francisco, but since 1990, he'd spent a week or two each year acting as a tour guide on adventure trips all around the world. Accompanying him was a fellow tour guide, Marta Chase, a 59-year-old medical diagnostic consultant who'd been leading hiking trips ever since she attended high school. Tagging along with her was her husband, Kikab Castanenda Mendez. Dyer, being the nature-loving enthusiast he was, would have loved nothing more than to see a real polar bear in the wild, but he thought he'd be extremely lucky if he actually saw one. As a result, he was thrilled when tour guide Rich Gross suggested going on a hike that would almost certainly result in the group coming into contact with the park's population of polar bears. After hiking for a while, Rich announced now would be the time to set up a camp. The camp consisted of a few tents to sleep in, a cooking area to cook and store food, and perhaps more importantly, an electrified fence that stretched around the campground a fence that was advertised as being capable of delivering an electric shock powerful enough to scare off any wandering predator, even though it was just powered by a couple of double D batteries, the same ones you'd likely find in a standard flashlight. The group knew the potential danger they were embarking on, yet they elected to hire a dedicated polar bear guard instead of opting to just carry around flare guns and bear spray. After going to sleep at around 10 p.m., the group woke up the next day early in the morning to the sound of one of their fellow members announcing that he'd seen a polar bear by the beach. Dyer quickly jumped out of his bed to witness the majestic animal. As he and the group made their way to where the bear was spotted, they soon saw a mother bear and her few-month-old cub only a few hundred yards away from where they set up camp. He was overwhelmed with joy. His eyes were fixated on the mother's every move, and he sat there admiring the creature's natural beauty, especially the young cub. Eventually, Gross announced it was time to head back to camp to have breakfast. After eating, they all geared up and went out to explore the mountains. They hiked through some of the most breathtaking views of nature, the icy lakes, the snow-covered mountains, the crystal blue water. It was all perfect. In the near evening, at about 4 p.m., they stopped near their camp and decided to relax for some time as they were exhausted and their feet were sore due to the hours of hiking. As they hunkered down, Dyer spotted a dangerous figure a hundred yards away that seemed to be stalking the group. It was a full-grown male polar bear, 10 feet tall, larger than any bear they'd ever seen. Compared to the female bear they had previously seen, this bear was twice as big and had a broader coat. It approached them slowly, putting out its tongue and sticking its nose in the air as if it were evaluating the two-legged creatures it had just come upon. They spared no effort to scare the bear away as it kept getting closer, grouping together to appear larger and more intimidating and making loud noises. However, this did little to stop the bear, who was now rapidly approaching them from less than 50 yards away. Rich had no choice but to pull out his flare gun and fire it at the beast. The animal continued to move closer to them as the flare was shot. However, the bear turned and raced off in a dead sprint when the shot landed in front of it, causing a second blast. Realizing the danger they had put themselves in by sitting down outside the relative safety of their camp, they quickly gathered their things and made a beeline back to their tents. The crew was ecstatic they arrived at camp since adrenaline was surely pumping to their bodies. Everyone appeared to believe the danger was over, except for Dyer, who was uneasy about the whole situation and felt the bear wouldn't give up that easily unless it had a plan. And as it turned out, it did, as the bear would be later seen a few hundred yards from the camp. Dyer and his team had established it would simply sit there for hours peering at the camp from a distance as though studying their behavior or looking for the easiest target. Gropes wasn't concerned. 
That's what the fence is for, he told the group. As much as Dyer's crew assured him that they were safe inside the camp, he still could not bring himself to fall asleep. So, Matt positioned himself outside of his tent and stared down the bear as it watched them while the rain poured down. He remained there for over an hour, gazing at the bear and being soaked by the gloomy gray sky as the day wore on before finally giving in and going to sleep. The crew spent the entire day of July 23 observing the bear with binoculars. The bear appeared calm and unthreatening, spending the majority of the day dozing off. Later that night, a group member by the name of Eisenberg decided to check up on the bear's whereabouts before dinner, but discovered it had mysteriously vanished from its original location and was now nowhere to be seen. On July 24th at 3.30 a.m., the group would be woken up by the sound of blood-gurgling screams coming from Dyer's tent. The electric fence was not enough to stop the 10-foot bear, who easily managed to break through it and reach Dyer. The unsettling shriek startled Rich to wakefulness. He reached into his boot, close to his head, and pulled out a flare gun. He ripped a zipper off his sleeping bag and jumped from his tent. Marta Chase's tent was right next to Rich's. She was terrified when she heard the frightening growls of an adult polar bear coming from the tent next to hers as she made her way outside and peered through a small window. The bear looked enormous and white as snow, aside from the black on its eyes and snout. The beast ignored Ridge as its eyes were fixated on Dyer. It ripped helpless Dyer from his tent by the head and began flailing his body around left and right like a rag doll, his sharp fangs tearing through flesh and slicing through bone, all while the group watched in utter disbelief. After Dyer stopped moving, the bear leaped over the electrified fence with Dyer's skull in between his jaws and made a run for it, likely hoping to reach the nearby beach where he could then drown his victim and enjoy his meal without disturbance. It was now 3.32 a.m. Even though it was pitch black, Gross and Chase could still make out the polar bear was running away with one of their traveling companions in its mouth, and things weren't looking good as Dyer seemed to have stopped yelling for help. Rich and fellow group members chased after the bear, with Rich firing and hitting the bear with multiple rounds of double flares, before the bear finally loosened his clamp on Dyer's neck and vanished into the darkness. When Rich finally reached Dyer's body, he was badly injured and unconscious. His jaw was crushed, his neck and lungs were punctured, he could barely breathe, and he was bleeding profusely. Rich attempted to radio for help but was informed that because the region was currently entirely shrouded in fog, there was no prospect of them receiving it till it was clear. The group tended to Dyer's wounds as best they could as they waited for rescuers to come save him. At 8.30 a.m., nearly seven hours later, the clouds began to clear, and a reassuring sound of a helicopter engine finally echoed from afar and looked to be moving toward them. Matthew Dyer was promptly strapped to a carrier and hoisted into the chopper. From there, he went back and forth to various medical centers, with none being suitably equipped to offer the kind of care that he desperately needed. Upon arrival, doctors would readminister sedatives previously given to Matt before patching him up again and recommending a different medical facility. Eventually, Matt would arrive at Montreal Center Hospital, where he would finally receive the care he needed. Medical reports regarding Matthew Dyer's condition were astonishing. The bones in his left hand were pulverized, both of his jaws were crushed, one of his lungs and part of his throat were punctured, and one of his vertebrae were broken. Yet, despite all that, miraculously, no vital organs or arteries were damaged, which explains how he managed to survive as long as he did. Even more shocking was that even though the 750-pound polar bear was flailing him around by the head, Matt managed to survive with his spinal cord largely intact. Matt's wife learned about the horrific incident and traveled to Montreal to be at her husband's side. On the 27th of July, doctors would inform her and Dyer's tour mates, who all came over to see how he was doing, that Matt's condition was stabilized and that he could be discharged in a matter of weeks. Fast forward to the present day, and Matt has made a complete recovery. His love for nature and the outdoors hasn't faded one bit. He even got a brand new tattoo of a polar bear to symbolize his life-or-death encounter with this ferocious predator. 
Matt's physical recuperation from the bear assault may have taken a while, and although his voice was left permanently affected as a result of an injury sustained to his vocal cords, he now feels emotionally stronger and all the more appreciative of the people who contributed to his survival. Very few animals, let alone people, survive an encounter with a full-grown male polar bear, especially not one who managed to clamp down on their heads with his powerful jaws. In the end, Matt probably survived off of pure luck, and his experience now serves as a constant reminder that nature and its wild creatures are not to be taken lightly. Any situation can turn nasty at any time, and before you realize it, you could be standing at the threshold of death, watching in horror as your grip on life crumbles before you, witnessing nothing but darkness after suffering your final affliction. These giant animals with muscular bodies would make your blood run cold. Grizzly bears are also extremely dangerous animals as they possess immense physical strength in combination with the bite force of almost a thousand pounds per square inch. However, humans are not the grizzly's usual food source. I know that we've all heard of grizzly bear attacks in the mountains, but in truth, grizzly bears attacks are most times usually a response to fear or feeling threatened. And just as with humans, grizzly bears don't like to be surprised. In today's story, we'll be talking about this four-year-old grizzly stunt bear named Rocky. Rocky was born and raised to perform staged attacks for the big screen with his trainer and Hollywood stunt double, Randy Miller. Rocky was also everywhere on the Discovery and National Geographic channels, among other appearances he made. But it seemed he was most famous for his appearance in the two 2008 blockbuster film Semi Pro, where he starred alongside Hollywood funny man Will Ferrell. The movie depicted the two wrestling one on one on screen. However, seven weeks away from the release of the film, Rocky had gained the spotlight, but this time it was for all the wrong reasons. This is the tragedy of Rocky the Stunt Bear and the unfortunate, untimely death of Stephen K. Miller. Stephen K. Miller was born on May 6, 1968 and was widely known as an American animal trainer, wrangler, and stunt double who had an unfortunate encounter with Rocky the Bear while making a promotional video. Miller had worked as a trainer at Predators in Action, an animal training facility operated by his paternal cousin, Randy Miller, who trains wild and exotic animals for film and television appearances. At the time of his death, Miller was not working as a trainer, but was attempting to shoot a promotion video where he would perform a bear wrestling stunt supervised by Randy Miller. Stephen Miller was also an experienced animal trainer who had worked for Predators in Action for several years before leaving to pursue other business ventures. Surprisingly though, he was actually very experienced with bears, having helped Randy Miller raise and train a previous bear named Dakota. However, Rocky was a well-trained animal and had been performing on screen without any issues. And on the day of the incident, being April 22, 2008, while filming Stephen Miller's promotional video at the Predators in Action facility, Miller was killed by none other than Rocky. As earlier mentioned, Rocky was a bear actor who was trained to wrestle humans. Stephen Miller had asked to be filmed wrestling Rocky for an advertisement. Although Stephen Miller had not been involved in training Rocky, the plan was to first take some shots of Stephen Miller and Rocky casually standing standing next to each other, and then later, the staged wrestling match would begin. However, during the initial shots, Rocky stood up in his trained wrestling posture and suddenly began the staged attack too early. He had caught Miller off guard without his arm raised in the proper defensive position. Randy Miller then hit Rocky with a cane, trying to make him let go of Steven. But according to a later statement made by Randy, the action might have unwittingly escalated the bear attack. The seven and a half foot tall, 700 pound bear in a sharp burst of aggression bit Stephen Miller on the neck. And after a brief struggle that lasted only about 10 seconds, the attack was put to end after Rocky's trainer squirted him with pepper spray. Initially, Stephen regained himself and ran to safety, appearing to be unharmed. But suddenly, he collapsed to the ground in not less than a minute and died instantly. It was later discovered that Rocky had peed 
pierced his jugular vein and carotid artery. However, an autopsy was also later conducted and they found that he died within minutes of the attack. Following Stephen Miller's death, the California Department of Fish and Game initiated a probe into the events of the attack with the intent of eventually deciding whether or not Rocky would be euthanized. People from the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA for short, and other animal rights groups who've long protested the use of wild animals in films had called for Rocky to be spared and to be allowed to retire to a zoo or another similar facility. It was later revealed on the National Geographic Channel program, Grizzly Face to Face, Hollywood Bear Tragedy, that the coroner's office and the California Department of Fish and Game ruled Miller's death accidental and did not order that the bear be euthanized. However, Rocky was required to live under restrictions and was no longer able to have contact with persons other than his trainers. He could no longer be exhibited or used for film or TV work. Despite this travesty, Andy described Rocky as loving, affectionate, friendly, and overall a safe bear. In Grizzly Face to Face, Randy Miller has also stated that he planned to continue working with Rocky and tried to get the restrictions lifted because he believed that Steven would have wanted that. In 2012, the California Fish and Game Commission considered whether to lift the restrictions on Rocky's permit to allow him to again work in the state of California. According to Randy Miller, and Rocky's legal team, new safety protocols had been put in place. Other animal trainers and experts had supplied testimony that Rocky was not dangerous, and a petition drive had also shown that many persons from around the world supported his return to work, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture had cleared him to work. With the only remaining restrictions being in California, the location of most available work for Rocky. Following a hearing on October 3, 2012, the commission decided not to remove Rocky's permit restrictions. The Sun had also previously revealed some of the world's most horrific bear attacks, showcasing the brutal reality of the cuddly beasts. And while attacks on humans are relatively rare, they can be particularly vicious, with the powerful animals able to smash skulls, pulp faces, and skin their victims alive. Rocky might not have been dangerous and must have gotten confused with his part of the script, but predators will always be predators. And whether or not you're an experienced animal trainer, never let your guard down while in the same vicinity as a wild animal, or else it's likely that what happened to Rocky might repeat itself. If you guys have any other true horror stories you'd like me to cover on this channel, let me know in the comments below and leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day. I'll see you in the next one. This is Final Affliction.